three, two. Welcome back. WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We're at Lexington Market, Fadley Seafood, awaiting the crab cakes, and uh, I've got uh, all sorts of uh, sparklers. Matt Gallagher, a good American, is here uh, from Goldsecker, <laughs> as well as Don Moeller of Catonsville, where they will be uh, celebrating. Uh, we'll be at Jennings. We'll be at State Fair uh, for 4th of July and beyond. We're downtown right now. So this is one of your favorite places, right? Oh, yeah. I'm here for lunch a couple times a month. <laughs> you know, we usually do the getting to know you segment in the beginning, and we even did that for, like, Barbara Mikulski. A lot of people don't know about your background and – um, and, and your background, Martin O'Malley. But more than that, Calvert Hall, uh, you're, you, you're from guy. Hamilton, a kid went to Loyola, played pretty good soccer, the whole deal. But uh, your Baltimore experience from Hamilton, I mean, yeah. my, mine's legendary. I did it in the radio over 30 years from Dundalk, but I got a lot of friends from Hamilton over yeah. there. So Baltimore born and raised, uh, you know, Gallagher's a pretty prominent name in town, some lawyers, some elected officials. I'm not related to any of them. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Um, I'm from the firefighting Gallagher's. Um, I had a grandfather and an uncle and a couple cousins who serve in the department. Uh, my other grandfather uh, pumped gas at the Exxon Station on Northern Parkway and um, Lock Raven Boulevard. Used to sell Christmas trees there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my dad went to the seminary here in Baltimore, met my mom while he was cutting the grass at the uh, cathedral up on Northern Parkway in Charles. So How do you meet someone city. cutting grass? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> so my <laughs> uncle and my, my parents dad. My at a ball game. Right? My <laughs> uncle and dad were cutting grass at the uh, cathedral, and my uncle brought my dad home to meet my mom who lived in Govins. You know, he was in Hamilton. You know, and they had to take the bus to see each other. Probably. Well, you know, look, car. it was a, it was a simpler time. It was a more effective time too, I think. <laughs> but um, now, nah, but they got together. Uh, our family has been here ever since. Um, absolutely love Baltimore. Um, grew up on Eckerdale Avenue, right in the heart of Hamilton. Had a great experience going to St. Dominic's. Um, you know, went on to Calvert Hall, and then college and graduate school in Philadelphia. Came back to Baltimore in 2000 to work for Martin O'Malley. And was with them for about 13 years across City Hall and the State House. And then, uh, you know, when my government service was over, I was very, very fortunate to be asked to come lead the Goldsecker Foundation, which has uh, been around for about 45 years here in Baltimore. We're, uh, we've got $115 million in assets. Hmm. We've given away over $100 million. And um, we focus all of our grant making, community development, education, and nonprofit capacity building. Well, let's 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 pick up on that, Nestor. That's sure. a great leap because one of the, we, we we eventually want to get into state stat, city stat, sure. all that. How to make government work? But let's. Everyone talks, Matt. When we Nestor and I, when we meet folks, we say, "Who should we have on?" And your name always came <laughs> up, along with other foundation folks. And it came up because people really see the foundations as one of the keys to helping get Baltimore turned around. So let's peel that onion back a little bit for us. Folks out there who don't know, t talk to us a little bit about the foundations, not just gold sucker, and how they do make a difference. Because yeah. people well, don't I always know. hear about the Harry and J Jeanette Weinberg. Weinberg like, that has been going over 30 years. Right. And like, and my involvement with Ed Block, I've been listening to these old tapes we're presenting. I hear the Harry and Jeanette. And, and I drive around and still see their names everywhere. I mean, yeah. That, that's a hell of a legacy to yeah. make the world a better place when you're gone because you left enough money to do so and entrusting a guy like you to take care of so it. So right? tell, tell us how they work and how, because no one really, I mean, when I say no one, the average person out there knows you. Know, they've heard Annie Casey. They've heard uh, Meyer Hoff and, as, as Nestor said, all the others, Weinberg. You can go down the list. But talk to us about how the foundations work. First of all, how do they raise funds and then how do they decide which projects are worthy? Yeah. So the vast majority of foundations in Baltimore, if you're talking about Casey and Weinberg and Abel and Goldsecker, these are fully endowed foundations where a person or a family decided to donate all of these assets to create a foundation. And then there is typically professional staff who are involved in giving that money away. The money gets dispersed every year to nonprofits. Um, you know, big and small, sometimes for programs, sometimes for operating, sometimes for capital expenses. There's billions of dollars in philanthropic assets in the city. You know, the Casey Foundation's $3 billion plus. The, you've got a couple billion at the Weinberg Foundation. You've got $300 million plus at the Abel Foundation. And typically what happens is they give away about 5% of that money every year. 
So when Goldsecker was founded in the mid-1970s, you know, Morris Goldsecker had passed away. He had an estate worth $11 million. He donated it to start this foundation. That $11 million from 1975 is now about $115 million. Yeah, wow. I saw that. And that was that, remarkable. In I, that yeah. time period <laughs> since, we've given away over $100 well, million. Well, I always think about growth of one's right. personal money or one's personal assets. You never really think about, well, we're giving away 5%, but we're making 85 and a half, and we do that over 30 years, and if the money is managed well, yep. what, what Morris wanted to happen back in 1971 well, will be he, done. He right? wanted it to be a perpetual asset, ongoing, forever. And we tried to manage the assets. Is that an American thing? That didn't happen to 100 years. 100, I mean, literally, were there... I wasn't there. I don't no, know. No, that just <laughs> feels to me like something that didn't exist 100 years ago anywhere in the world, right? Like, the, this is a very unique concept of generosity. Phil and it is. It is. But there's incredible wealth in the United States. And right now, you've got a generation that's coming into incredible wealth right now. And whereas Morris Goldsecker wanted it to be a perpetual asset, you have some philanthropists who want to see all that money given away during their lifetime. And then you see some philanthropists like Gates and Warren Buffett who've pledged to give away everything before they die, or almost everything. So Everyone tells me Bashadi's going to do that. You know, that Bashadi wants, you know, wants to give his money away and wants to make well, the world a better Well, he's an place. incredibly generous person right now, and he supports a variety of causes all across Baltimore. Very proud to serve on the board of Catholic Charities with him, and he's an unbelievable supporter of what Catholic Charities does. So, so Matt, go back really a couple of components. $11 million, uh, almost 50 years later, now is over 100 million, not to mention that you've also given away 100 million. Right. So 11 has become two. Is, is part of your job managing the assets as president and CEO, is, is that fall to you? So we have an investment committee. We actively manage the portfolio, and I'm a member of the investment committee. Some foundations hire a professional chief investment officer. Some foundations completely outsource it and are in a series of passive investments. You know, almost like, you know, you invested the endowment in a 401k and Vanguard or somebody else is managing for you. It totally depends on where the assets came from, what the vision was of the founder of the foundation, and then whatever the board thinks is the best way to kind of marshal those assets for the future. So how... In your world, in that foundation world, I heard again this morning that we are in the longest, although slowest, recovery in American history. As we know, business cycles, it doesn't go on forever. How, how much does that impact the thinking of those of you in the foundation world to know that we, at some point in the next couple of years, whether it's 19, 20, 20, we're going to have a turn down? What, Slow hey, down. Look, hey, look, if we have a turn down and we have a huge reduction in the value of the assets, it diminishes our ability to make grants. So the 70 or 80 nonprofits in Baltimore City that rely on support from the Gold Checker Foundation, you know, their uh, prospects can kind of rise and fall with the market, um, you know, because it impacts the amount of money that we can give away. Because we have a perpetual outlook and the idea is to be around forever, we try to be long-term investors. And we also try to allocate our assets so that we have a certain level of liquidity so that we can absorb a couple of years of market downturn without disrupting you know, our grantees. Typical grantee for the Gold Sucker Foundation might have a half a million dollar budget, might have you know, six to seven full-time staff people, and then hundreds of people who rely on what they do. You know, we don't want to send a shockwave through that organization if there's a market downturn and we happen to be 20% of their revenue every year. So we really try to be thoughtful and purposeful, manage the money well, make sure that we got enough cash on hand to kind of absorb the occasional shock and, you know, really try to be a partner in terms of financing the good work that happens in the city. So now, now you're in the room. Now you, you make the grants annually. So, uh, so we give away, uh, you know, a little more than a million dollars every quarter. Every quarter. Yeah. Okay. So share with us, is it, are those grants driven by a general vision uh, that's always been there? And then how do you identify who you're giving money to? And then more importantly, because I know if there's a Gallagher involved in this, there's some accountability. <laughs> there's no way you're just writing checks and saying, hey, have Give a away would be the wrong That would be the wrong. If, yes. if I know Matt Gallagher, there's some accountability. How does all that happen? So if you're a nonprofit, 
you can apply for funding from the Gold Checker Foundation. We will go out and visit with you. We'll have you into the office. We'll check your references. We look at your business plan. We look at the activities that you're involved in. And then, you know, it's a competitive process and we make strategic decisions as to where we invest. Gold Secker is one of the largest community development investors in the city. So we invest in community organizing, we invest in CDCs, we invest in access to mortgages. You know, our theory and you know, our kind of model is that we want to make Baltimore a great place to live, work, play. We want there to really, you know, focus in on the affordability of the city. We want to see people have a path to home ownership and we want to try to make neighborhoods as strong as they possibly can be. So if we can get neighbors and communities organized, if they can put forward a coherent vision, we're willing to invest in that, provide like backbone operating support for that type of work. You know, we'll do loan guarantees, we'll do lease guarantees, we'll join together with other philanthropic funders or government funders to help bring a project together. Uh, we, you know, our mission is to improve the city. It's for its people and its institutions. So there's a lot of ways you can do Well, that. give me the one thing that you're most proud of. Oh, Maybe something that just right. came for you because I'm not familiar. I mean, I'm literally not. I'm familiar with you and your work, but not the Gold Secker Foundation. When did you become involved in that? And, and I guess there was a ramp up into that, too, to know what they did. You knew of them before you yeah. became the guy. So I'd never met anybody from the Gold Secker Foundation who was on the board before. I'd been exposed to the Gold Secker Foundation and its grant making. And in the time I worked in the mayor's office and the governor's office, I'd interacted probably with 75, 80% of the grant recipients of the Gold Sector Foundation. So I'd never worked in philanthropy, but I was very aware the of their work. The name kept coming up. Yeah, the name kept coming yeah. up. And when I was stepping away from government and I went and met with all the people that I rely on for advice, you know, the, the Bob Embrys of the world, the Don Fries of the world, the Rick Burns of the world, and they all said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to have an impact. I want to be back home in Baltimore. I want to be much closer to the work than I was at the state. And they said, you ought to think about philanthropy. So when the opening, you know, when Tim Armbruster, my predecessor, decided to retire, I applied. I went in and I said, look, I know your grantees. I know the city really well. Um, I would love to get involved in this type of work. You know, and remarkably, I came through a process, and uh, I've been there for six years ever since. Matt Gallagher is our guest from the Gold Secker Foundation, so make sure no, we, we reset here. At we reset. Yeah. We're, we're at Fadley's. Again, we thank our sponsors, Jennings State By Fair. By the way, Big you were happening. talking like, you know, getting into some wonky th thing, and, and the smell <laughs> happened. It and is I, happening. Yeah. I, I, I it is happening. The I think the fryers are on. The first crack yep. cake went down. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it is happening. It loosened me up a little bit. I mean, I'm so not going to lie to you. I want to jump on Nestor's question because it's funny. Sometimes we have telepathy here. It goes back and forth. I'm sure it's like someone saying to you, which of your children do you like the best? Well, I, I, I like them all. You know, I love all my children. But if you had to, if you were out, somebody grabbed you on that elevator. We're big on these elevator speeches and said, give us one or two real success stories of your foundation where you've given money, you've gone out, you've held them account. And, and said, I could drive over you there said, and say, hey, what said, are they You said, man, that, that's making a difference. What, what, would, what would one or two of them be? Yeah, I mean, the first one that comes to mind, really because it's been since I've been at the foundation, is we've been a big investor in an organization called Baltimore Corps. Um, Baltimore Corps was founded by Wes Moore and by a guy named Fagan Harris. If you've never heard of Fagan Harris, he is a real comer. He is, uh, you know, a former Rhodes Scholar, Stanford and Oxford, um, just an absolutely brilliant guy from this area who's come back and is doing a remarkable job identifying people who want to get engaged and involved. He's created a fellowship program called Baltimore Corps. He has reached into communities that have been typically underserved to identify just unbelievable candidates, women and people of color, to serve in leadership roles in nonprofits and government. And he started with a core fellowship program of about 30, 30 to 40 people per year, and he's built it out now that they're, uh, they run the Public Allies program, they run the Mayoral Fellowship program, they run a program called Elevation Awards where they give $10,000 grants to you know, community-based entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs. Um, and now they've got a thing called Kiva, which is a platform for small business lending. So he is really out there, active in the community, finding people who have not typically been engaged and really kind of harnessing this incredible human capital that's in Baltimore City. And we've been very, very proud to support his work, to help him expand his work. 
And, um, you know, I even serve on the board of uh, Baltimore Corps because they're having a real impact in people's lives. Really about building capacity. It's building capacity. It's, you know, infusing these dynamic young professionals who are very, very committed to the city into leadership positions and really seeding, you know, diversity and inclusion and new ideas all over Baltimore. That's one I'm proud of. You've probably heard of a program called Thread. You know, we've been <laughs> Every th Sarah Hemminger. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're having her on, Matt, because I'm telling you, it's it's a recurring theme on here. You mark Thread. my words. Well, right you know now. what the recurring theme is? That there's a lot of good people doing good stuff in well, this right. city. I mean, I'm, that's I'm a theme. telling you right, right now, now, Sarah Hemminger is going to get a McCarthy Genius Award at some point in time in the future. She's that good. The impacts that she's having on the kids that she's working with and her volunteers are working with is absolutely phenomenal. And it's great because they're, you know, Sarah's exactly the kind of person you got to hold up to show it can be done, it can be done at scale, and that there are some really incredible investment-worthy opportunities here well, in Baltimore. Tell folks what Thread does because they've heard us mention Sarah and they've heard us mention Thread. Break it down for them since you're involved. Well, I'm going to learn because I'm going to be listening to Baltimore Positive <laughs> yeah. in the summer. So. And that's what, I mean, this is when Baltimore Positive really takes off, when you're talking about these programs and saying to folks, stop with all the negative stuff. Stop, would yep. you? Get down here, get a crab cake. Listen to some good stuff. This is a great city. So tell us about Thread. So Thread is a, the most intensive kind of mentoring program you've ever third, heard of or thought of, where they take the, the kids who are entering Baltimore City Public High School really at the lowest level, the ones who are going to be most challenged academically, socially, you know, in terms of their home life, and then they make a 10-year commitment to each one of those kids. 10 years. They surround them with a family. They call it a family of volunteers who take responsibility for everything. Take a child, a, a student? A student. They surround them with a family of volunteers who collectively take responsibility for getting that kid to school, making sure they're fed, connecting them to a summer job, helping them apply to college or some type of you know, post-high school career path. And they stay with them for a decade. And the impacts that they're having on these kids are absolutely incredible in terms of graduation rates, going on to college, finding jobs, getting into more secure housing settings. And it's really showing that there's a lot of people in Baltimore who are willing to get involved, who are willing to volunteer. And even if you're talking about the populations in our public schools who are the most challenged, if you provide the right consistent level of support, they can be successful as well. So those are so two. So you don't throw your hands up and no. say, "Oh, these kids, these kids don't have the right background. These kids' parents necessarily aren't there for them." You don't say, "Well, then we're going to forget about." They've that. got challenged backgrounds, and look, there are very, very real challenges in Baltimore, from systemic racism to poverty to you know the conditions that a lot of people live in in parts of the city that they shouldn't. But they can be overcome with the right supports, with the right with the right level of engagement whether it's from the government, the nonprofit community, the business community, there's nobody that should be written off. Well, Matt, this is where I always say I get on planes, and one of the reasons I'm inspired enough to do this while the Orioles are in the toilet is I fly to Cleveland. I fly to Detroit. I've been doing it for 30 years. I go, and I say this all the time. There are places that get better or worse. My wife hates that I'm always judging. That's an eight. That's correct, nine. though. But it's true. You get off the plane, you say, Detroit, 2006. I'm doing some of these interviews as part of my July nostalgia stuff from the, from the Super Bowl. I saw the city start to turn then. In 06, I went back again in like 12, and I'm like, oh, look at what happened here. Now, you know, I got a lot of friends that live there, and they say that not fixed is probably the wrong word, but when it's going in the wrong direction, it gets corrected, and, and you see it on a different kind of trajectory. Nashville, Jacksonville, these places you go and you see them getting better. Our city's a place that has challenges, but there are people here ready to make it better. Absolutely. You're not far removed from years where we had fewer than 200 homicides. Right. You're not far mm. removed from years where population has actually gone up. If you think, you know, retrospectively over the last couple of decades, and you think about some of the great things that have happened in Baltimore City, we just kind of got to get them all going on at the same time. Well, that's and a that question I have for you, Matt. I, I apologize for interrupting. No. Because one of the things we do here or folks will raise as a question is do do the foundations coordinate do you all have any communication within the foundation world or are all of you sort of out in your own silos now there's a huge amount of coordination we have you know groups that we get together on a very regular basis and the vast majority of projects that you see on the capital side or institutions like Baltimore Corps or Thread, you're going to see a capital stack where you're going to have a Goldsecker, a Casey, a Weinberg, and Abel all plugging in and doing what they can to help support those types of efforts. 
But it's really important to point out, though, that like while the focus gets on philanthropy, if you look at every dollar that's spent in a year in Baltimore City on kids, okay, every single dollar, you're talking billions and billions of dollars. How much of that money do you think is coming from philanthropy? What do you think? What percentage? What percentage? I would say some. I, I you know I would say, I would say 20, fifteen or f- 10, 20, 15, yeah, 20. That's yeah. what I would say. That's what I would say. It's two percent. Two percent. Two percent. So. Have yeah. the foundations don't believe in the kid? I mean, no, no, no that's that's the foundation no giving away the amount of money that they can give. The overwhelming amount of money that gets spent on kids in Baltimore City is being spent by the government. You think about a mil- a billion for in public education money. You think about all the money for public health. You think about juvenile services. You think about recreation and parks. Philanthropy is a relatively small drop in the bucket. So in a perfect world, philanthropy can be the risk capital, it can be the proof of concept, it can get people to say, you know what, that model works, let's make it bigger, let's scale it. But ultimately, you've got to get the public sector, the city government, the state government, the federal government to say, that's the way we should be doing it. We've got to migrate our policies and practices into the things, the evidence-based practices that work. Because evidence, we, there can, we, go. We, <laughs> can put, we can put our fingers in little holes. We can say, here's a little bit of money to get that pool open. But if you want systemic change, you've got to have a functioning government, and you've got to actually have the government putting the resources where the money needs to go. Oh, they, what a perfect place to come up to a break because when we come back. crab cakes are hot. We've, I smell the <laughs> crab cakes. We, we've gotten, I think, a great overview of the foundation world. Then Absolutely. I want to come back and talk with Matt about how to make government work because this is the guy that was on the ground floor of city stat, state, state stat. We held people accountable. I want to hear what, how that works and roll that curtain See, back. my show gets good. I got a former Baltimore County executive here. I got uh, Matt Gallagher here from the Gold Secker Foundation working a long time with Martin O'Malley in the city and at the state level. We're going to come back. We're going to eat a crab cake here at Fadley's. Someone has been criticizing my crab picking skills, Matt. <laughs> I've heard. Uh, and, uh, you know. We're going to have a little We're gonna have a little test at the end. I do think it's an east side, west side <laughs> thing because everybody on the east side eats in the way I do. But that's what I've learned on Facebook. We're Baltimore Positive. We're WNST.net. Back for more from Fadley's with Matt Gallagher and Don Moeller.